you know, was always saying, just do it, just enter it and, and get, you know, feedback from it. And I did that with the Schwarzbier last mm -hmm. year and, and placed uh, in the Schwarzbier category. And the best yes. part was that I got all the information back from all of the judges that said mm -hmm. this and that. And it was just a really nice learning experience. Welcome back everyone to Vermont Craft Tours. I'm Sarah Scully and I'm here today with my friend Neil Fitzgerald. Neil, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. Um, Neil is an accomplished crafter on a couple of fronts, so we're actually going to do two different videos with him. Um, and in this first part, I wanted to talk to Neil about his homebrew setup um, and you can see his kitchen behind us. We're down in his basement. Um, so Neil, what uh, first got you started on a homebrew path? What was the first inspiration for that? Um, when I lived in Potsdam, New York, um, a good friend of mine, a neighbor, opened a homebrew shop oh. in downtown Potsdam. And it was the up and coming new thing to do. Um, and uh, Mark today is actually a very successful businessman having started that business first in downtown. And everything came in cans. It was all malt extract. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I said, this just sounds like a great hobby. And I yeah. uh, did uh, extract brewing for 20 some odd years mm -hmm. until I moved uh, to this area in central Vermont, uh, joined the homebrew club, and uh, with the help of many friends, learned how to do all grain brewing. Yep. Um, and a... such our love for, for drinking <laughs> and, of course, making beer, and I right. really do enjoy it, mm -hmm. um, decided to set up a kitchen that would make it user friendly, easy to do, mm -hmm. and um, and produce some, some good beers. Yeah, I love that you have a dedicated space. I think that's a great um, thing to have if you have have room for it. If sure. If you have a place to put yeah. that in, then you don't have to clean up all the beer stuff if you want to cook a meal or something like <laughs> right. that. Um, yeah, so um, tell me more. So you worked with your friend Mark, he got you started. Um, was there any kind of a club or a group around there that There was actually a club, and, and on a Thursday, one Thursday a month, uh, Mark would open the store after hours, and there was about eight mm -hmm. or ten people that showed interest. Yeah. And um, that's where he actually had a hot plate. We actually made a batch of beer. Oh, cool. So not knowing so any, together. we worked yeah. together on that, and mm -hmm. um, he was very well supplied. Mm -hmm. He also was um, a dartboard store, so the combination was perfect. <laughs> you brewed and yep. you played darts. Yep. Um, and he introduced us to the original Coopers and all of the. British lines, and after making a few of the batches right off the bat, um, found that we really loved it, and mm -hmm. that it was a real step up from the kind of beer we had been drinking, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been hooked ever since. I've really never stopped brewing uh, that 25, geez, it, you know, to tell you the honest truth, it's almost 30 years ago now. We yeah. like to think yeah. it was only 20 years ago, but that was <laughs> a short period of time, and uh, I've brewed many, many batches, and uh, I'm hooked. Mm -hmm. And now that I started grain brewing, I uh, actually started in my shed before I had this room downstairs and humped the water around and it was pretty hard work. Yeah. Uh, the chilling, setting, setting up, up holes, and setting up the propane yep. and tried to decide how could I bring this to the house. And mm -hmm. fortunately I have a very nice full basement and I've been eyeing this corner of the basement for uh, the few years we had lived here yep. and said, this is the spot. So it took about a year to formulate yep. how I was going to do this. Yep. Um, and uh, because I'm in the basement, we need to do electric brewing, mm -hmm. which has um, yep. become another viable option. Mm -hmm. uh, most people who do grain brewing in large quantities, five or ten gallon batches, are on propane, uh, of course. Uh, that was not an option in this basement. Mm -hmm. For ventilation, you for have to ventilation. Do that, yeah. So you have an induction burner, right? I have an yeah. induction burner. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an article in BYO magazine uh, a couple years ago on how to do it with induction brewing, and that said, you know, ding! I said this this is what I need to mm -hmm. do, and um, I bought a very powerful induction burner that uh, makes the job very fast. Mm -hmm. um, it's a three thousand watt induction burner, and it takes five six gallons of water to boil. A very short period of time right. uh, so it makes for a quick day also very mm -hmm. clean um, yeah 
And, and you just have one burner. Sometimes I just, people will have multiple burners or multiple kettles. We, right. So I'm still using um, mash tun, igloo yep. a ton and a cooler yep. to do uh, the whole batch. And, um, you know, in a way, it's, it's a very secure way to brew because your temperatures do stay mm -hmm. very steady during that mash period. Mm -hmm. uh, a little tougher to do decoction mashes where you're raising and lowering temperatures. It can be done by adding water. But um, with the, the modified malts that we have today, it's not really necessary. And mm -hmm. I've had great results from doing uh, pretty much just uh, straight out sparge yep. and collect. Yep. Um, then uh, we run it through. I, I put a pump system in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, Rick's been inspired to do kind of duplicate your uh, yes, setup at our and house. Yes, I can't wait too. to help we're, him start setting that up too. That, yeah. So uh, it's really great. Just one little pump made all the difference of moving mm -hmm. water around, not having to lift every gallon off mm -hmm. the ground and getting that going. There are some points in time when you have to lift a, a carboy or do a few things, but mm -hmm. as I get older, I'm hoping I'm working on that too and coming up with some lifts. That'll help move it around. Oh, nice. So yeah. we're hoping this is kind of an adaptive brewery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was an adaptive PE teacher in right. my early days. Okay. So I, I yep. worked with a lot of uh, therapies. Mm -hmm. And I said, how can we do this without me breaking my back? Right. And uh, even though it's only five gallon batches, it's still a lot mm -hmm. to lift and take around. And so this brewery waters. is kind of set up that way. And a pump, of course, being the best way. Uh, that 90% right. of the work is done by the pump. Uh, and it's efficient, and mm -hmm. I really like it. It yeah. seems to be working really well. Cool. And what are you brewing today? We're brewing an Irish red ale today. Mm -hmm. So that'll give me just enough time before March 17th to uh, get this fermented, mm -hmm. get it to clarify a bit, and then we'll force carbonate. Okay. Now, if I was bottling this batch, I would have wanted to start maybe three weeks ago, mm -hmm. a little sooner so it could bottle condition, but yeah. I'm going to, uh, to uh, keg it. And I also yeah. figured that being... Um, St. Patrick's Day, there'd be a lot of empty bottles around. <laughs> so why not go out of the keg and right. uh, and take it from there? So yep. Uh, yep. And, and you uh, just recently got some little mini kegs. I got some mini kegs, which was uh, the next move up and uh, for traveling, for picnics, mm -hmm. for the back deck, instead of uh, moving around five gallon uh, carboys plus a small uh, carboy I, um, keg. Mm -hmm. Um, will fit in a small refrigerator also. Oh, nice. Yeah. So we can keep it, keep it yep. chilled and do mm -hmm. some things like that. So uh, those are becoming more and more available online mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know they existed. And, of course, the torpedo kegs and some of the real fancy stainless steel ones have been on the market for a while. But uh, right. if you look closely enough online, you might be able to find some good corny mm -hmm. keg. Yeah. Uh, and I did. I found yeah. four of them from... They probably came from some back factory in Detroit somewhere, and yeah. uh, they needed a lot of cleaning, but they cleaned. Right. And they, they look beautiful. That's the great thing about and stainless steel is you really can scrub it and just And they're totally get it rebuildable, going. and yeah. all the parts are still available, mm -hmm. new posts, new uh, gaskets and things. So mm -hmm. that's not a hard thing to do. And yeah. I, I like kegging. Uh, I bottle um, special batches mm -hmm. and portions of special batches for competition. Yeah. Um, we I do it for cellaring sometimes. And we go brew a higher alcohol beer and want to keep it downstairs, so we'll do sure, that. Sure, yeah. sure. So bottle conditioning, especially pilsners and things like mm -hmm. that, uh, really do like that a lot. So yeah. I try not to get into too much bottling, but I, I was completely out of bottling for a mm -hmm. while and only kegging, only to find that uh, bottling is, still has its place. Yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. of course everybody's canning now. I don't know if the home brewer will ever be able to can or not, but... You never know. You one person with a really big basement, and you can all go over to their house and do canning, right? right? Canning all up. That Something would be like that, right. yeah. We could all pitch in for a canning machine. Something like that. That would take up the rest of your basement. That would take up the rest of the basement, right, in full funny. production. So tell me a little bit more about your brewing philosophy, if you will. Like, what kinds of styles are you drawn to? Where do you sort of get your recipes? Do you like to develop right. on your own, or do you riff off other things? Uh, I think we all do all of those. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. most home brewers, uh, I'm going to tell you, Scott Russell, Mm -hmm. uh, who you've done a video with, yeah. uh, the beer guru, who mm -hmm. was one of the first people I met when I had moved a few years ago here to central Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and his North American clone brews really gave me a start on recipes. Yeah, Because uh, e extract recipes are much different. Mm -hmm. And I did do a partial mash in those days and added some specialty grains. Mm -hmm. But going to all grain brewing was something very new to me. And Scott's book was 
very, very helpful. I okay. still reference his book mm -hmm. uh, often. Uh, there are recipes all over the web. And I think that the first year or two that I was brewing, sure, I, w I was grabbing recipes, mm -hmm. trying to learn what these combinations were and what, what I liked. And, um, right. and then probably as uh, uh, about a year or so ago, started developing my own recipes. Uh -huh. Now, were my recipes close to a lot of other people's recipes? Well, sure. I mean, right. a pilsner is a pilsner, a bohemian pilsner uh, is a bohemian pilsner. Yep. And if you want to stick with the BJCP guidelines, uh -huh. you got to brew pretty close to the, to the cuff, you know, on what sure. you're doing. Yeah. With that said, uh, experimental brewing is huge right now. Uh -huh. There's everything but the kitchen sink going in beers right now. So yep. uh, if you're not brewing for competition uh -huh. um, and want to get out of the style a little bit, it's really anything goes. The sky's the limit. Sky's even, for, the limit. even for commercial, you know, we talked to Ben Hill too, and he's all about, oh, you know, yes. putting coconut and who knows what in his beer. I just but, had his yeah, sea salt all, caramel all smoked place. Porter and that right. thing was it was really good mm -hmm. and and I think Mike is really one of the pioneers on the micro brew level mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. uh, doing what he's doing and yeah. we're lucky to have him right in our backyard. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the thing that makes him different is that I've had a lot of these like weird flavored you know peanut butter and jelly beer or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and so many of them use like extracts or fake flavoring. And it just doesn't work. But Mike uses the real thing. Mike uses so, the real thing. Have you, have you ever done any weird uh, spiced beers? Or uh, yeah, I, 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 and I really haven't. I think the, the probably the farthest thing out there I get there are some fruit beers. Mm -hmm. I have done strawberry, what I call a strawberry blonde. Okay, yeah. And just a blonde with some, uh, some strawberries. But again, I use fresh fruit whenever right. I use any of my... Uh, my recipes mm -hmm. and coconut. I made a coconut porter that I'm Excellent. actually going to enter um, a chocolate coconut porter. I call mm -hmm. it my choco cocoa nice. porter, and I'm going to be entering that in the noon in, which comes up in April. Okay, and that's just getting better with age. And mm -hmm. I used real toasted flake coconut in mm -hmm. that. Um, but yeah, I'm not real big on those adjuncts. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the herbals that people are using now. This mm -hmm. is really getting popular, Scott just told me about a um, hibiscus oh, yes. that he made. Mm -hmm. And he made it for Valentine's Day, and it was red. Yep. And I was up at the Three Penny Tap Room the other day, and I actually got a taste of their hibiscus beer from, oh, maybe Grassroots Brewing, I think it might have been. Okay. And it was very red and a little sour. Yeah. So well, hibiscus uh, is a sour flavor. The other one I really like is Judas Yell makes a hibiscus beer okay. that I've loved for, okay. for a few years right, now, right. but I hadn't seen anyone else doing it, so that's exciting. That's, that's exciting. Every yeah. every other beer, uh, I'm generally in every other beer person. Let me see, I brew probably a couple times a month, mm -hmm. um, and every other beer is certainly an IPA mm -hmm. because my wife and I both love our IPAs, yep. and I love testing hops, and I often call my beers the hop name so that I can keep mm -hmm. it in my head. As a matter of fact, one of the IPAs I have on tap today is a Comet. I yep. call it Comet First Flight uh, mm -hmm. from Falconer's Flight, which I love too. And um, I don't brew a lot with Citra, which is certainly one of the more common. Certainly popular in Vermont. Bursa, is certainly yeah. popular in Vermont. Yep. And uh, so trying to go off that a little bit, but pretty traditional hops, Cascade, mm -hmm. Centennial, Chinook, yeah. all the C's. I make a 4C, a right. 3C. And um, and since I'm not um, selling my beers mm -hmm. and need a real fancy name, I can call them whatever I want. Right. So yeah. that I tend to keep it simple. And yeah. I did just brew a copper ale, and uh, my daughter has a dog named Copper. Oh, so perfect. I call it Copper Dog IPA. There you go. And so <laughs> I think of those little things, and I try to brew. My names tend to take on birthdays and weather right <laughs> that happens but i like so. i like what you've just pointed out which is using you know one of the main ingredients the hops or maybe you could use the malt or something if you're trying to teach yourself to recognize flavors mm -hmm. why not just put that in the name or use that as a dominant ingredient That's and then right. you really get oh yeah this is what this hop tastes That's like right, right right okay it's got right. these characteristics here's what it tastes like cold warm whatever right and you can really get to know it Correct. well Yes. Doing that. So yes. that's a great that's a great tip. It's a great hop world. world. The hop world is and the IPA world is really, of course, just taken the country by storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, as I was just discussing with Rick a little while ago, is that um, 
they're really pushing the hop forward mm-hmm. beers right now. So mm-hmm. Heady Toppers and Sip of Sunshines have a lot of hops post boil. Yeah. And they use so many hops that it doesn't become quite cost effective for the home brewer. Mm-hmm. You can. I mean, it depends on how much you, you want to put into it. Right. But um, if you want to get those nice subtle flavors, I'm going to start brewing more hop mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and start experimenting with that now. Mm-hmm. So BYO Magazine is certainly a great starter point. And um, uh, from everybody, from the beginner to the advanced brewers, there's always a, a good idea right. in there. And I don't consider myself a brewer. I'm a brew helper. Yes, um, you are. But I, but I can read BYO Magazine and understand what the recipes are doing. Sure. Because, and they break it right. down you know, from, from extract to partial mash to mm-hmm. all grain, which is nice, too. So you, wherever you are in your progression as a brewer, you can kind of get... Sure. Dial that in, too, and it's it's super helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Great. Well, speaking of beer, um, we are going to have a tasting of Neal's, and I think we're going to have Rick come on camera and help us with that, so we'll be back in just a moment. All right, well, we're back, and Neal uh, has offered us some nice homebrew. Um, So, yeah, Neal, tell us what we're we're Uh, doing. This is a pub ale, so um, low hop, Mm -hmm. um, using... um, pale malts and some crystal malts and mm-hmm. pretty much a traditional pub ale. I think that in the winter, um, I tend to brew more or less hoppy beers than I do in the summer. Mm-hmm. So uh, again, every other it's beer, nice color. yes, it's a little, little bit darker. And this would be a traditional ale that you would drink at the pub in England. Sure. Again, low hop, a little bit low carbonation and just drinkable. Yeah. Cheers. That's it. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, it's nice. It does take me back to all of our trips to England. I was just going to say, so as often as nice we drink in, in pubs right. in England, this is very, very close to what I would expect to be the that kind of the house beer, the pub beer. Mm-hmm. Now, remind me, what um, what yeast are you using? This? Uh, just a Savelli, a dry yeast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use both dry yeast and liquid yeast, depending on what particular. If I'm really trying to dial in a real specialty beer... I'll spend the extra money on the liquid yeast, um, but I find Safeli and Nottingham and Lalaman, uh to be very good. Uh, the dry yeast do a great job, and I also propagate yeast, so I'll be able to get a couple of more shots out of my yeast mm-hmm. um, as it goes along and kind of stays in that flavor profile a little bit. Uh, when you are doing your dry yeast, do you pitch dry or do you make a slurry? I make a slurry, mm-hmm. but only about a half an hour before I'm ready to throw it in. Mm-hmm. So I don't usually make yeast starter. The only time I make a yeast starter is when I'm doing a lager, mm-hmm. so that it's got a lot of cells. Um, and yeah. I have a space underneath my porch here that's mm-hmm. connected to my brewery that's about 48 degrees, mm-hmm. and that's where I brew my, uh, I have a Dunkel and a Schwartz beer ready to go, and I'm going to do a Bohemian Pils. And uh, I just find that the starters with lagers Mm-hmm. Make it really, really makes it work really well. So uh, no, that's see. I mostly pitch dry. Mm-hmm. I have a tendency to use the US05 and a lot of things because I mostly am looking to bring out the flavors of either the adjuncts right. or the malts. Right. I'm not a big into bringing out the flavors of the yeast. But the time it would be different would be as if I was going to be doing a really big beer. I wanted to make a big starter so there's enough going Good. on there to yeah. kind of deal with all those sugars all and the sugars. high alcohol later yeah, on. Agree. Very, yeah. very, very good idea. Yes. And I'm just actually myself learning how to, to make uh, yeast starters and um, uh, and mm-hmm. bring that out. It's not really very difficult, just like any uh, home brewing itself. It's about the equipment and a little bit of knowledge and uh, experimenting mm-hmm. a little bit with yep. that there. But yep. uh, I've had good luck with dry yeast also, and I agree with you. The Cefeli 04s and 5s are don't change your flavors very much. Now, if I'm going to make a saison, which right. are, we're coming up pretty soon, mm-hmm. I will hit even with dry yeast. I love the uh, the Belgian dry yeast from uh, either Lalaman or uh, saison yeast or Cefeli's um, mm-hmm. has their own. They have a new one actually right now, and I'm going to try. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get too much off of our tasting this beer, but I did have one question about yeast while we're speaking about it. Have you ever done anything with a wild yeast or tried to see if you have a local open yeast ferment open or ferment like or anything like that? And that would be the, that would be the next thing. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, and I mentioned to Scott about using wild yeast and, of course, souring and doing those things. And uh, the one uh, big piece of advice that Scott gave me was that if you're going to do that, do it with all separate equipment. 
Oh yeah. Uh, and that I haven't gotten to yet. Mm -hmm. So my my aim is to do some more souring, and I also do ciders, which which I love. Will sour also with natural fruit. Mm -hmm. So it's tart cherries and kind of sour that way. So my answer right. to that would be no. I have not done a lot with wild yeast, and I think mm -hmm. that that is a uh, another whole chapter in right. the home brewing process that I'm actually looking forward to trying mm -hmm. for our. Uh, our viewers out there who might not be familiar why Neil said you need separate equipment is once you sour those tubes that equipment you're using is always kind of kind of be sour and you run the risk of introducing these funky flavors right. to your other beers that you don't necessarily want to have right. Right. Flavors. you should assume right. that it has that bacteria in it that beneficial bacteria the but it's beneficial there, all, bacteria. The time. It's there yeah, all the time so I've been mm -hmm. am I gonna say I've been a little afraid Mm -hmm. a little, uh, uh, to to jump into that yet, but uh, I think I'd almost like to take a little course in that, yeah. You know, and really really that. learn what uh, what I'm yeah. doing. And I know a lot of people love sour beer, and I, I like sour beer to a certain level. And mm -hmm. I've had hermit thrushes. Uh, I just had it a little while ago, the po tweet, and mm -hmm. it's sour. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's just another flavor palette. Hermit Thrush is a Vermont brewery that is known for its sours. And their head Thanks. brewer, or at least their leader, is the current uh, president of the Vermont Brewers Association. Yeah. Oh, very good. So speaking of, of beer good. infrastructure and the Brewing Association, I did want to talk to Neil about your experience um, with competition. What What has driven you to enter competitions? How does that you know, sort of influence well, your decision making in terms of brewing beers and sure, there there's no doubt that uh, Carol Hall, um, who has uh, been a Vermont Home Brewer of the Year and part of the Hops Club unit that we had here in Tunbridge, we've now morphed into a unit out in Lebanon, New okay. Hampshire. Okay. Um, you know, was always saying, just do it, just enter it and and get you know feedback from it. And I did that with the Schwartz beer last mm -hmm. year and and placed uh, in the Schwartz beer category. And the best nice. part was that I got all the information back from all of the judges that mm -hmm. said this and that. And it was just a really nice learning experience. Right. So for me, um, you know, I'm not looking to put trophies on the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, you know, everybody loves to do something well. So I'm just trying to do it even better. So this mm -hmm. year I'm going to enter another Schwartz beer based on those um, findings from because, last year yeah, nice. and just try and learn some more about that mm -hmm. beer and uh, I think it's just a great way to learn more about the specific kinds of beer until we did the hops club which was only uh, Teresa and I you know been a part of for a couple of years uh, there were names of beers I would never even heard of mm -hmm. and it's really opened up my eyes to the whole world of brewing Right. One of the it's things nice. that you're going to, about entering homebrew competitions, as Neil said, you get the feedback from the, the judges. They don't know who you are. Right. So when you're sharing with your friends, you're going to go, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's great. And But they don't necessarily know what you're trying to get. They're not familiar with the BJCP style guides, and they might be just trying to get free beer. Mm -hmm. So if you really do want to fine-tune your brewing, as mm -hmm. Neil said, you getting that feedback from the judges is, mm -hmm. is helpful. And again, it doesn't have to be... Hardcore competition, it can just be educational. It's too. educational. Yeah. And there are so. so many of them. And of course, the one in Vermont is for Greg Noonan, who is the father of, oh, the father of the homebrew pub and homebrewing. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. it uh, gets a great turnout. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, so this year I'm going to enter uh, three or four beers. I have a chocolate, the chocolate coconut porter I had discussed mm -hmm. earlier. I'm going to give that a try. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a brown ale, mm -hmm. um, that I'm, a nut brown ale. Um, and a Schwartz beer mm -hmm. that uh, we'll get ready for pretty soon here. And, and again, just uh, uh, it, it really is just kind of fun to see what, uh, mm -hmm. what pe other people that, you know, my wife will always say the beer is good, you know, right. so that, that, that's good. Unless she doesn't <laughs> like it. I'm about to say, then she'll not tell you. Your back. Then she'll <laughs> tell you it's not any good, but at least she's honest that way. But right, right. Um, it's nice to get some good feedback in it. And again, you know, not looking to become an award winning, award winning home brewer. Just want to, you know, brew better beer. Uh -huh. And if yeah. I put a lot into this and, you know, we spend, a, you know, six, seven hours when it's brew day, it's a six hour day and, you know, you might as well do it right. And uh -huh. we've got cooking in our family. My daughter sure. is a chef. My son-in-law is a chef. Uh -huh. Teresa loves to cook. I love to cook. So uh -huh. it was kind of a natural morphing right. for me to want to do the home brewing uh -huh. thing. And 
And uh, I was going to say that earlier too, is that, you know, you were talking about starting with other people's recipes and then branching out from there. And the same thing is true. You know, Oh, Mac and cheese. Okay. Here's a, here's a four <laughs> cheese Mac and cheese out of this fancy cookbook. Okay. But what do I want to add to it? Sure. Or here's, you know, beef sure. stew, just like yeah. a basic beef stew mm-hmm. recipe. Okay. What do I want to sure. add to this? And I think, you know, brewing is exactly That's the why it yeah. is, but you can't really uh, copyright a recipe. You can, the, the lyric, the writings of it and, is yes copyrightable but the actual ingredients are not and that's why they're great uh jumping off points neil said in the earlier part of the interview that scott russell's uh, book was instrumental in his same with mine Mm -hmm. it's helpful to when you say i know what this beer tastes like i'd like to brew this beer and then i'll know whether or not i got close because i can either go buy that commercial beer and try it but it's helpful when you're trying to meet your targets and learn the the craft and to learn the craft it is yes well here's to um education Educating yourself, educating yourself with friends and sharing, and uh, good luck on competitions well, this thank year. You. Yeah. Thanks, thank thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So we'll we'll link again to the BJCP styles and um, other resources we've mentioned in this episode. Um, just look for the show notes below the video. And don't forget um, that if you're going to be tuning in for the other part of this video, to subscribe and check on that little bell to be notified when there's a new video coming out. Oh, thanks a lot. Cheers for the reminder. Cheers. Thank you. Very thanks good. everybody for joining us. Cheers. Bye. Bye.